Hi everyone, um, welcome to this um, event this evening. Um, my name is Heather Doran and this event is hosted by the Levy Hume Research Centre for Forensic Science which is based at the University of Dundee. Just a few notes before we get started. Um, if the fire alarm does sound, um, we will need to leave. It's not a practice session, um, so we can leave it via the doors on the left here or um, by the back door there on the right, and then you just go around to the main road um, and we'll be escorted out. So if the fire alarm does go, that's what we need to do. We're not expecting that, hopefully it won't happen. Just a note as well on questions. There will be time for that. We're hoping to gather as many questions as possible from you um, for our audience, and that there'll be a chance for you to leave questions for our speakers at the end of this session tonight. We don't have a roving microphone. We can't come round with a microphone to the audience, so we may need to repeat the audience questions on the stage. So just bear with us while we while we do that. I'm going to hand over to our host this evening, who's Professor Meath McDade, who's the director of the Lee Hume Research Centre for Forensic Science. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed for, for coming out this evening. It's Shrove Tuesday, Pancake Day. So you're giving up your pancakes. Um, I very much appreciate that to join us um, this evening. We have a topic to discuss that's really interesting. And it's one that has um, carries with it a lot of challenge for the criminal justice system, but also the potential for the implementation of a new technology. And we begin to ask questions around could we or should we um, engage in this technology, which I think we will get into this evening. I'm going to not introduce the speakers or the, the people on the panel as yet, because uh, the first of them, Eric, is going to give a presentation, and I'm sure the others on the panel wish to see it, um, rather than craning their necks. So once Eric has completed his presentation, then we'll ask all of the panel to come up onto the stage and I'll introduce them to you. So Eric, I'm going to give you the floor and do a, a little quick introduction of yourself um, as you take us through your presentation. Good evening. Um, thank you very much. I'm delighted to be here and for us to discuss this important uh, topic. So, first of all, I'd like to ask you if any of you have taken a DNA test so far. One of those companies. Um, so let's start by talking about what genetic genealogy is. So, uh, what we mean by genetic genealogy is using DNA for, for genealogical purposes to infer relationships. And as part of these tests, you usually get uh, unmixture estimates and um, information about your health or, or other traits, such as musicality and other um, gene related uh, traits. And what's the most important part of it? The forensic context is a list of your genetic relatives, also known as DNA matches. Um, and there are three major applications of genetic genealogy that we have so far. So the first one is the, the traditional genealogical applications, which we can use for learning more about our ancestors. Uh, we can also use it to uncover more information about unknown parents or in cases of adoptions or families or NPs. There's also the social dimension, for instance, in Poland, where uh, many older people discovered the Jewish ancestry when they were saved from the Holocaust and learned um, and, and who their biological parents were. Uh, and you can also confirm different genealogical hypotheses in your family tree as well. Uh, the second uh, application of genetic genealogy is uh, victim identification. Uh, so, so far with the use of forensic investigative genetic genealogy, over 400 um, um, unknown remains have been identified. Many of them uh, are rape and murder victims. Um, they come from various ethnicities. And uh, many of these cases are very, very close. So, uh, so the oldest case solved in the 1916. Uh, and a lot of these cases were solved by DNA Hill Project, which is um, a, a non profit that started in 2017 in America. Uh, it is a non profit run by volunteers and often relies on crowdfunded projects. And the third application is uh, perpetrator or all suspect identifications. Um, and so far, 600, over 600 cases have been solved using um, the, this method. And that includes cold cases, some of them dating back from the 70s, some of them uh, can't, be, can't go to trial because of statute of limitations. And even when the case isn't strictly speaking solved, it still generates investigative leads 
so you can predict someone's spatial uh, structure or, or their geographic origins. And in many cases, it also leads to exonerations for people who are uh, falsely accused or, or charged with crimes they haven't committed. So how does email epidemiology compare to the conventional methods that are used so far? So the conventional methods rely on uh, basically autosomal SCRs, and, and this DNA fingerprinting uh, was finally by Alec Jeffers in 1984 in Leicester. And the uh, National DNA database in the UK is um, one of the best functioning in the world. It's, it's the oldest one. Um, it encompasses around 8.5% of the population, which is, uh, which is around 6 million people. Uh, it has a hit rate of around 66%. And it also allows for familial research where it's first and second degree relatives can be, uh, can be identified. And the assumption uh, with this uh, with this method was that these SDRs do not reveal any medical information. We know nowadays that this assumption isn't entirely accurate, but that was the original assumption that was behind uh, this method. Uh, when you look at genetic genealogy, um, there is um, a significant difference in, in the way what we test in, in, in using that test. Uh, so, first of all, uh, we rely on international databases, so that's uh, over two, 2 million people uh, that are accessible to investigate genetic genealogies. It allows for detection of very distant relatives, so, um, so third cousins and beyond. Um, but often uh, they are more time consuming to solve, but proportionally have a higher hit rate when adjusting for their population size. The downside is that some populations are under tested and um, and the aim of this methodology is to slowly uh, build the family tree of the person of interest uh, up to the grandparents and parents and all the way down to, um, uh, uh, to the person that we're trying to identify. Uh, and we're quite, um, so, so the chances of identifying the person using this technique uh, are quite high. So it is 66% using uh, the conventional method and with genetic genealogy. If we have a database that has fans around 2% of the population, then we have 99% probability of identifying at least a third cousin, which often leads to a uh, successful identification. Um, uh, there are also uh, empirical studies done in the UK that we can rely on American databases to identify people of British descent. Um, and, and we can also um, uh, see some additional challenges in that are case specific if somebody comes from the Japanese population. That these cases can be solved even using um, very distant uh, matches. Uh, there are many ethical considerations with this method that differs greatly from the conventional methods, and also some bits that arose uh, in the press during the last couple of years. Uh, the first one is that uh, that it is an international database, so um, so you might be willing to support the justice, but at the same time, um, you need to take into consideration that you might also be supporting in a way capital punishment if the jurisdiction allows it. Uh, there were also historical cases of unethical use of uh, investigative genetic genealogy of those into uh, unauthorized databases. Um, sometimes people remain suggested to identify the mother. Um, there's also a question of informed consent. Some of the companies use opt out models so people might not be fully aware of, of the data being used in this way. There are also some data breaches that occurred in the last couple of years. And so far, we have no uh, formal accreditations for the practitioners. Uh, some of the common misconceptions that we face in the field is that, um, that it is necessarily uh, more expensive or more complicated to uh, do international uh, genealogical research, which isn't always the case because so many databases are now available online. It is no longer true that uh, Western Europeans can be identified. Um, it's, not, it's also not true that uh, practitioners have access to raw data of their matches, so, uh, so that uh, limits uh, the amount of medical information that can be gleaned from, from, this, um, uh, from this test. Um, um, and also means that, um, uh, that conventional uh, methods um, also reveal some medical information uh, and as well as genetic uh, genealogy. Uh, so the future of forensic, forensic investigative genealogy is, um, is quite right in terms of uh, the possibility of solving the cases. So at the moment there are over 40 million people that have taken such a DNA and some more and more people load the data to, uh, to uh, the external databases. Uh, populations are becoming more and more diverse. There are also new databases that are created um, specifically for forensic purposes uh, that rely on volunteers and loading the, uh, the data. More and more countries are adopting or considering to adopt um, this methodology. Uh, and also we have clear uh, guidelines um, in, in many countries regarding um, the ethics and, uh, 
and the availability of this method using them in different cases. Um, so in America, there are a lot of um, unsolved homicide cases, which is also what's been uh, driving uh, a push to, towards genetic genealogy in Scotland. We're very fortunate that 100% um, of, uh, of homicide cases from 2013 to 2023 have been solved. Um, there are some other cases uh, from the UK that haven't been solved yet. Um, and, and around 7 to 13 percent of rapes or attempted rapes were prosecuted. So some uh, some of those cases that were prosecuted might have not been prosecuted because the perpetrator wasn't identified. And just to finish, um, I would like to quote uh, one of the uh, 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 one of the FBI agents who commented on um, on this method uh, that cases may grow old, investigators may change, but this proves that law enforcement victims are never forgotten. Speaking uh, about uh, um, a teen killer that was identified uh, from the murder case from 1970. So we're left with a question when old methods have failed, could we and should we use genetic genealogy to, to bring uh, justice? Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Eric, and that sets the scene, I think, really nicely for us. Could I ask our other panel um, members to just come up onto the stage. Thank you very much indeed. So I'm going to do a, a very quick um, introduction. Stephen Ferguson, just here on my right. Um, Stephen is the forensic lead um, for uh, technical lead for DNA at the Scottish Police Authority Forensic Services. First started in human DNA profiling in 1999 and then joined Logan and Borders Police Forensic Services in 2003. And since 2011 has been the lead technical authority for how DNA samples are processed and profiles within the Scottish uh, Police Authority Forensic Services. Next to Stephen is Alison Leslie. Um, Alison is a social work researcher and family historian. She's for many years been investigating and reviewing, or had for many years been investigating and reviewing child uh, and mental health fatalities and taken part in inquiries into institutional abuse. And she started researching family histories about 30 years ago. Drawn by, by like many, she says, for a love of history, a love of solving puzzles and a family mystery. Next to her is Dr. Brian Plasto. Brian is the uh, Scottish Biometrics Commissioner, the former Chief Superintendent and Lead Inspectigate Inspector with Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Constabulary in Scotland. And with four decades of policing experience in Scotland, Brian was appointed um, the Scottish Biometrics Commissioner by Her Majesty the Queen on the 12th of April 2021. Eric, who you have met, is a genetic genealogist um, and lecturer at the University of College Cork and also the uh, University of Limerick, and has been teaching genetic genealogy for the last four years. He's designed multiple courses on the topic, including Poland's first academic course in genetic genealogy in 2020. And he also has experience um, as a genetic genealogist. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly. I get the feeling yes. I keep changing how I pronounce the word. <laughs> Uh, helping people to solve family mysteries and learn more about their genetic heritage. So we have a, a, a panel, I think, that is very well equipped indeed to discuss the topic that is our topic of discussion this evening, and in particular about how we, or should we, uh, bring genetic genealogy into the, the criminal justice space. So I'm going to um, start, I'm going to um, put the question perhaps to you, Eric, um, to start off with. And then I have a specific um, um, question that I wish to put to Alison, and she's going to put up a few slides. It's just part of her answer. So to start off, Eric, are there currently notable cases of genetic genealogy being used in forensic investigations? Do you know of any cases where that has happened? And I might bring Stephen in just after that. After your well, yeah, so there have been over 600 cases, but I think one of the most interesting cases that have been um, concluded uh, recently is the murder of uh, Lindy Sue uh, Bickler, 
uh, from Lancaster County in Pennsylvania. And that's an interesting case because it highlights how much genetic genealogy can be used even with very limited uh, data. Uh, so uh, she was murdered in 1975, um, and years later, the DNA was extracted, and, and in 2000, it was uploaded to the CODIS um, uh, database. Uh, there was no match, um, and in 2020, that case was assigned to, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, to, um, uh, to genetic genealogy team, um, um, and it was led by uh, Cici Moore, who's the chief genetic genealogist in Parabon Nanolabs. And uh, they were able to identify the top match as sharing 30 centimorgans. organs. So that means that it was an even more distant match than the third cousin. Um, so instead of using traditional approach of building the family tree and, and, and identifying common ancestors, which in this case would have been in the 17th or 18th century, she decided to focus on the geographic origin. Uh, and she was able to identify that four of the grandparents of that uh, suspect uh, came from, from a small town in southern Italy. Um, so, so she uh, tried to identify people of Italian origin in the county that lived in the 70s. And there was an Italian club uh, for, for Italian uh, emigrants, and there were more than 2,000 people. And she was able to trace uh, all of them uh, that would potentially fit the criteria of having four grandparents from, uh, from that specific town. She was able to do it. Uh, so she passed on that investigative lead from genetic genealogy to the investigators and they were able to confirm that this person actually lived in the same apartment block but was never formally a suspect. Um, and then surreptitiously they uh, also obtained a DNA sample from the coffee cup that, uh, that he left at the airport and that uh, proved that it was a perfect match. And, um, and after so many years, 50 years, they were able to uh, to identify who, who committed the crime. So that's, I think, one of the more positive um, cases. Right. And, and these are really compelling. So even in, in, in Scotland, do we have, um, or Scottish forensic scientists who may um, have cases that they're interested in or that they, they, they speak about in this space? I hate to disappoint people by starting <laughs> off on a slightly negative note, but the answer is not yet. This is very new. Like, you know, it's a new approach. It's using new technology in the laboratory and combining it with genealogy is a relatively recent development. That's not to say that we wouldn't want to do it because, of course, we would. There are going to be cases and there, there are high profile cases that I'm sure you can think of um, where um, there is a, a murder has been committed, but there are no suspects or the suspects have been eliminated as, as, as being responsible. And therefore, those cases are, are, are paused. But as the last slide of Eric's presentation said, you know, the cases are not forgotten, the victims are not forgotten. And uh, Police Scotland do have a unit that looks into cold cases and it's had some successes recently with mm -hmm. traditional methods. And if you think to last year and the murder of Brenda Page, the trial um, of the, 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 the husband of Brenda Page who'd been murdered in 1978 and he was found guilty last year. Part of that was, was DNA evidence using the new technologies we have now. Um, but inevitably, um, if you don't have a suspect to compare the, your DNA profile to, you need to look for some new avenues. And I would hope we would be able to use this at some point in the future. Thank you. And then, Brian, if I can bring you in. So are there um, cases that perhaps people are using with you as a as a means of saying this is a technology we should start to think about using. That's a bit of an unfair question, but you know. Yeah. I think this is a trick microphone that's yeah. Well thanks uh, Neve. Um I should say before answering that question, I'm not a forensic scientist. I'm a I'm a police officer by trade and I just happen to be the Scottish Biometrics Commission at the moment. As Stephen said, it's never been used in Scotland and that's largely because there hasn't been a need to use it in Scotland. I think in your slide at the start, you showed the number of DNA profiles in the UK DNA database. It's enormous. There are more citizens in our DNA database in this country than there are in probably any other country in the world. So what that actually means is that um, most of the time, when the police recover a DNA from a crime scene, they can. I think the figure used was 60%. And most of the time, they can identify that person through conventional 
uh, techniques. Um, another point worth making, though, is that that figure of 60% is quite misleading because most crimes are solved by the police without any uh, forensic component whatsoever. If you were to ask a different question is um, what percentage of crimes are solved by DNA, then the answer would be less than 1%. So it's important to keep that in mind. And then the other thing to say is about DNA is I'm a big fan of DNA, right? It has shaped my career. I joined the police in 1978, which was the year after the World's End murders. I retired from the police in 2013, and those murders were still unsolved, but they were solved by a DNA time capsule. So it's very powerful stuff. Um, on the pendulum, um, is it a boon? You know, I'm probably more in the sceptic, um, but I could be convinced. <laughs> Thank you. Alison, I'm going to turn to you now and um, ask you a um, slightly different uh, question, and I know we might put up this, your, your, your slide. Um, so, can you, as, as somebody who uses the, the genetic genealogy to, to solve puzzles, as you said, um, and, and perhaps sort out some, some questions that families may have, what are some of the implications? of these ancestry databases for families and for individuals who are, are looking for that family history? I think, Neve, the, the, the key is in what you just said at the end there, um, uh, you know, this, the, what are the implications for people using this for family history? The reality is that the existence of DNA databases that are marketed for genealogy, family history purposes, is that they affect everybody. I mean, unlike a lot of activities, if you're not particularly interested in joining the WI or joining a church or uh, taking part in a particular sport, you can say, fine, nothing to do with me, and you can keep you know your views and, and your privacy. The problem is that even though you hate the idea of doing a family tree or um, getting into genealogy, you are likely to be on one of these databases someplace. Because I've put that up just so that you can see the absolute scale of um, these databases. We're talking about millions of, of, of people um, across the world. And the most powerful statistic or, or, or fact is the one at the bottom. If one of your third cousins, that's somebody with whom you share a great, great grandparent, if one of them or somebody closer is on one of these databases, the chances are that you are in somebody's family tree. Um, and, you know, you can have up to 800 third cousins or closer, just, just to put this into context. So there is a vast amount of information about a vast amount of people. And unlike in with most things in our lives and in our society, where the information that your private information, you most of the law is predicated on giving you a degree of control over it and how it's used. In these databases, you know, it's like the Wild West. There can be all sorts of things there. And the problem is, and if we take the example of Ancestry, which is the biggest one, the one most people have heard of, an awful lot of it is wrong. Um, one of my great grandparents is appears on in 27 family trees that people have made on Ancestry. And in 24 of them, the information is wrong um, because one person has got it wrong and a whole lot of other people have copied it. So there's information that is inaccurate. And I think that's one of the things. There is all this wealth of information um, out there which we don't have any control over it. And the problem is that if I have my DNA tested and uploaded to a database, it doesn't just affect me, it has implications for the privacy 
of everyone to whom I am ge genetically linked. And one of the, 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 the problems comes when people get unexpected results, unexplained findings. And um, they're sometimes called, and I think Eric sort of mentioned this term, NPEs, which can stand for non paternal event i tend to think it was non like think of it as non parental event where somebody doesn't have it turns out through uh, dna testing that they do not have the 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 the, the biological parents that they think they had and it's most often a father uh someone who's on, on who they grew up with thinking as their father or whose name is on the birth certificate is not their biological father um it can sometimes be the mother um i'm sure everyone's come you know heard of cases where someone has grown up and discovered later on that the person who raised them as their mother is in fact their grandmother and their biological mother is actually a, a sister so people things like that come out and the difficulty is that I mean, the reason these things come out is not because of the new technology or DNA or databases. I mean, these things have been happening since time immemorial. It's human nature. It's the human heart. Even, you know, people who are adopted have, have, have you know, had sort of, you know, unexpected revelations of, of their circumstances. Um, I have a, a, a good friend who in her 20s, was standing in the street in Aberdeen chatting to a friend who out of the blue said, of course, everybody knows you're adopted. And she didn't. The most awful way to find out. But what was significant in that situation for that person who is now who now spends a lot of the time uh, helping sort of other adopt adoptees find their biological families was that it was private and it was contained they were able to go back talk to their family and in a loving setting you know the, the matter was discussed and you know to, 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 to as much as possible resolved the problem with genealogy databases like ancestry is that i can have my dna on there and some of my cousins can have their dna on there and I can look at their matches and realize that a person that I grew up with thinking was my first cousin isn't related to me at all or is only partly related to me. And can I, I just realize looking out into the audience, there's quite a lot of my cousins here. And can I say that was just hypothetical? I am sure you're all really my cousins. And if you're not, I'm still going to love you very much. <laughs> so, but the, the point I'm making is that you then, you people all the time are learning not just about their own unexplained um, sort of relationships, but those of family and whose responsibility is it then to share that information? How is it sh shared? We don't really have a framework for doing that. I, I think that that raises some really interesting and, and, and actually quite profound questions. Um, and, and I'm going to turn one of those to you, Stephen. Um, and that is knowing what what we've just heard and knowing what we know about the way in which this data is being used to search family histories, for example, but also the wild westness of it. How practical do you think it is to bring this kind of technology into forensic science, not just necessarily in Scotland, but in general? And in particular, where the DNA of, of, of a person of interest or of a person associated with the case might not be provided voluntarily. So I think the big practical obstacle is firstly the technology and bringing it in and, and installing it in the laboratory and finding out how to, to get it to work and use the software. It's much more complicated. It gives us way more data than we get with our current could, methods. Could you maybe just give a, a little bit of, of, um, of information about just how you do that sort of validation in in the context of forensic science? What level of detail do you need? Oh, so, for example, um, we'd have to kind of do a proof of concept with samples from known individuals and make sure that we got the same profile over and over again from that individual to show that the result was repeatable. Then have to do some testing with the, the genealogy side of things to make sure that the individual's the profile that we got from, from the from the areas of DNA that we would look at for genealogy 
actually led to the right conclusion. That's almost testing both our method in the laboratory and testing the genealogy databases as well. Um, but we operate in a very regulated environment. We are ex inspected every year by um, an external body who hold us to a very high standard, a regulatory standard that I think the genealogy laboratories are not held to. But we would have to make sure that the samples we were handling were all handled correctly, there was no contamination, and that the profiles we got were correct and, and were accurate. And that takes a lot of time. Learning how to use something is is easy, but showing other people that you know how to use it properly um, is, is, is very, very time consuming indeed. I forget what the second part of the so, question so it was. In, oh, in particular, looking at DNA samples that might be taken um, from people without the consent, consent. issue. Yeah. So I, I think the cases, the, the types of cases that Eric mentioned, the consent issue isn't really too significant. Um, if we're trying to find the identity of a victim or an unidentified body, then there's no consent issue because they're dead. If we are trying to find the perpetrator of a crime, let's say a murder, um, or a stranger rape, or maybe the, the semen or blood of it, the crime scene, then we don't need the consent of anybody to, to get a DNA profile from that crime stain. That's what we're there to do. And um, if we were able to produce something that was suitable to search on a database, we would be able to do that without any issue. The challenge, I think, would be legally afterwards. Um, if we we obtained a profile that was suitable for comparison in, in the genealogy database, and um, then genealogists got to work, identified the person of interest, and the police arrested them. The first thing the defence lawyer is going to ask is, why have you arrested my client? And if we say, well, we, we've, we got this profile and we searched it on Ancestry.com, uh, then the defence lawyer is probably going to have a fit and go straight to the, the judge to try and get this overturned. And we won't know what that situation is until either A, it's tested and it happens, or until regulations are set up, and, and this is the best way to do it, that the rules are put in place so we understand whether this is possible or, or not. Um, yeah. I just, very, very briefly, I'm being very cheeky here, <laughs> but the, the unintended consequences thing is absolutely something to be wary of. First of all, in our own regular DNA profiling, we do have occasion to test, for example, fathers and sons in the same case, and we have identified instances where they do not appear to be related, or we can say with real confidence that they are not related. But we don't disclose that to anybody because that's not really our business to disclose it to, to either the, the police or to the, the people involved. So we just really set it aside. Mm -hmm. um, but all I wanted to say rather cheekily was my uncle um, in, in the United States did one of these tests when he was in his mid-70s, and he discovered two half-siblings that he did not know he had. And one of them was a woman in her 80s who had no idea that her father had not been her father and wanted nothing to do with my uncle. And the other one was a man of the same age who had grown up in a house without a father and suddenly knew who his father was and knew that he had siblings that he had no idea of. Um, and the punchline to this is that my uncle's father was the town milkman. So, <laughs> I swear that's true, so there is, there is clearly a, a germ of, of, of truth in, in that. I think, Go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I mean, I, I think that you raise a really important distinction between the way um, DNA is used in regulated professional forensic settings, which have got codes of conduct and are very bound by sort of high ethical standards. And the problem is then you're trying to link that up with, you know, what I've, I've called the Wild West, where people very often have no hesitation in messaging complete strangers in the other part of the world and saying, by the way, you're sort of, you know, you don't appear to be the child of the person that you've said you're the child of. And that's the problem that happens. I mean, and it's how you balance that and I have to and again I I would be the first to say that these databases bring some people incredible 
joy and sort of, you know, completion and, and answers to, to things that they've been struggling with for years in terms of relationships. Um, through Ancestry, um, I made one of the, 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 the most wonderful friends I've experienced in my life. And with the help of Neve and her team and through information we found on Ancestry, we were able to um, sort of a couple of years ago sort of correct a, a terrible injustice that had been done to a soldier in uh, World War II. And it would never have been possible without the availability, availability of that information out there. But it's how you find a mechanism to allow the positives to go forward while making sure harm is not done to people by, you know, folk turning up on their doorstep or whatever, um, you know, announcing their, their relationship. Um, 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 really, I think, important naughty issues, and particularly, I think, the use of one technology and translating it into a use in a different space that perhaps that initial um, uh, technology breakthrough wasn't designed for. Brian, it raises questions about, I suppose, the biometric data that's that's contained within people's DNA and, and, and the, the the biometric data for the genetic genealogy as opposed to what's used in um, forensic forensic um, uh, DNA profiling. As the in your role as the biometrics commissioner, you, you you pay a lot of attention to these things and in particular to aspects. Um, related to the retention of, of biometric data. What's what's your thoughts around if this kind of technology was to be introduced? What concerns would it give you or what um, happy place might you find yourself in? Yeah, as I should probably say that um, Scotland has a um, piece of legislation called the Scottish Biometrics Commissioners Act 2020. Most of you probably never heard about it. Um, but if you want to double the number of hits on my website, just Google <laughs> Scottish Biometrics Commissioner. Um, but um, the point of mentioning that is Scotland has a unique definition of um, what constitutes biometric data. So um, in England and Wales, for example, there's a, at the moment, it's about to be abolished, there's a, a biometrics commissioner uh, and his uh, responsibility is solely in relation to fingerprints and DNA. The Scottish definition of biometrics covers all forms, so it doesn't uh, just cover DNA, it also covers the source materials from which a DNA sample uh, can be created, so the body fluid, a, a DNA mouse swab, etc, etc. Um, I'm kind of on the same page with Stephen as this, which is um, one of the reasons why DNA interpretation and analysis in the UK has not been controversial, and this applies to fingerprints in, in recent decades as well, is because the techniques that are used by the forensic scientists are independently validated and accredited to an international scientific standard. In Scotland, we also have a statutory code of practice on the use of biometric data and technologies approved by the Parliament in November 22. And in relation to, um, although Scotland does not have a forensic science uh, regular or a forensic science code of practice, the biometrics code of practice requires that any um, scientific techniques that are used in relation to biometric data or technologies uh, should be accredited to uh, an international scientific standard. So I think the answer to this is, if at some point in the future, Police Scotland or others chose to go down this route, then you would have to try and do it through an accredited uh, scientific route which addressed all of the various ethical concerns that, 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 that others have, have discussed. That's, that's um, very interesting indeed. And um, Eric, you were, you started it all, started us off by giving a really interesting presentation about what this technology is. What having what you're what, what, what we're saying. Where do you see um, the next steps or what needs to be done or, or indeed can it be done to reach the sorts of standards that Brian has been talking about and Stephen has been talking about? Oh, well, there, have, there has been a, a study a couple of years ago that looked at the possibility of applying um, genetic genealogy to forensic cases uh, in the UK. It was uh, based on 
on profiles that were voluntarily submitted for the study uh, and they were uploaded to JetMatch. And so there were 10, uh, 10 people that participated in the study and four of these people were identified. And that was in 2020, early 2020. So I, I presume that now it would be even more than just four people out of 10 that would be identified. So we know that it is possible. Um, I think another important aspect is that genetic genealogy is it's a mix of different uh, different fields. Uh, so uh, not very many universities teach genetic genealogy, and I think that is something that would potentially help us establish good standards, both ethically and in terms of, of science. Uh, very often, genetic genealogy sits in humanities, which isn't completely right, because it, it seems to be that the focus is more on genetics and genealogy. So, uh, so I think there are different ways uh, to approach this topic. So as education, a proof of concept, as you mentioned as well, and uh, and also uh, consulting uh, the public or what their opinions are as well. That would be interesting to do. Thank you very much. I'm just going to put you on notice that I'm, I'm getting to the time where I'm going to be able to take a couple of questions from the audience. If you have a burning issue you want to ask, um, then I'll, I'll come to you in, in a few moments. I suppose I'm going to come back to, to, to yourself, Stephen, and I'm going to ask each of you the same question. In terms of what the potential repercussions are of this technology, both not just nationally, but, but uh, at an international level, and, and Eric mentioned in his presentation the different laws, for example, around data privacy that might exist in different countries, but equally the, the, the sort of ramifications for, for use of technology like this. So what do you think are the potential repercussions for the use of this technology, if indeed the genie has been let out of the bottle and it's coming, then what do you think about, should we be worried and how do we set aside those fears if we can? I was going to say, I don't think we should be worried, although I think Alison made some really good points about um, the concerns that, that um, spring from the fact that Anybody loading themselves to this new database voluntarily is also loading their, their whole family. And the point um, that I think Eric made about um, uh, some jurisdictions have capital punishment. It's one thing to, to kind of volunteer, well, if anybody's been caught, um, you know, is a person of interest in a crime, that's really their responsibility. And the fact that my DNA has helped. Um, identify a third cousin uh, isn't, isn't really not my responsibility, but but a debt penalty is a, is a is a different issue altogether. I think there's also um, an issue in the fact that these are commercial companies and that people. It's you know I'm used to working in this environment where it's a a government run database. Both the Scottish and the UK databases are are run by government um, funded organisations. These are commercial companies. What are they? might be do with the data they may offer safeguards i'm sure that they do when you sign on the, the dotted line but it feels a little bit less safe for want of a better word than 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 having um, government in control of, of these things in, in particular Alison, same question to you yeah i think these are really good points and the reality is i mean um, Eric mentioned GEDmatch. Now, that is a database where people voluntarily upload their DNA um, data, hoping to find you know, relatives and so on. And so there is a, a voluntary aspect in that. But although um, companies like 23andMe and Ancestry um, ask you for consents as you sign up, um, I really do not think that what people are giving is informed consents. Um, the implications are not being explained. Um, these are, you know, as, as Stephen said, commercial companies. They're not actually really interested in you discovering who your great granny was. What they want is your data because it is being sold, um, sometimes anonymized, sometimes not so much to companies and universities for research, for health analysis and so on. Um, Ancestry asks you if you want sort of to contribute to sort of health research. And lots of people say, well, of course I want to be part of an effort to find a cure for cancer. And they're not realizing the implications 
of loading up what can be highly personalized data um, to sort of, you know, that we shared with people, they have no idea whom. And I think that this is one of the worries that people are not being made aware of the implications of what they're handing over or being told fully how it will be used. And I think that has to be addressed alongside the second element, which is the duty of care that is completely absent from all of these companies. Um, Ancestry offers support. You have to go through about five different levels to get to a page which has got four links on it, um, You know, three of which are totally inapplicable to NB outside the United States. Um, and it ha- I think there has to be more marketing of these things in a more responsible way that isn't about it's going to be really exciting to find out what your great granny did in world war one and more about you need to be careful because you might find out something about yourself or your family that you weren't expecting and if you do this is how we're going to support you through it brian you were unintended consequences well not you personally obviously but the unintended consequences that you think might yeah, I mean, I think, uh, again, I would just probably say here that um, in relation to existing international exchange mechanisms for um, for DNA, these are arrangements that have developed over time. Um, there are various legal frameworks in place. One known as Prum, Prum's a, a small town in Germany, but, but that's a... a an arrangement whereby um, European nations in the UK will exchange uh, fingerprint and DNA data, but it's on a it's on a hit no hit basis, and there are lots of safeguards built into the system to make sure that um, a foreign state is not seeking um, someone's data um, for the purpose of assassinating dissidents or for the purposes of honour based violence and so on and so forth. So I suppose on the international exchange part is because there are so many ethical issues, as we just heard, um, it could really only happen if there was a proper um, legal framework in place. So, yeah, that's not to say that that will never happen, but I, th- I think at the moment it's um, it's probably quite a distant thing, I would say. And there was the second part. Um, it, it, was, it was really, um, is there sort of anything that we can we we can do now that this technology is is here the the possibility of it um, coming into the criminal justice system in this country what what safeguards can we put around that yeah well again it's um i suppose there's two things here one is about is there a business need and i'm not convinced there is i'll be i'll be brutally honest i don't think there is a business need for it in the uk that's not to say that in the case of an unidentified body, for example, where you have exhausted all other options, um, there, 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 could, there could be. So on business need, I don't think we're, we're anywhere close to this in the UK, personally. But um, again, um, if we were to go down this road, in addition to there being a clear legal basis for doing it, uh, there would have to be suitable, independent oversight uh, mechanisms now in relation to the existing UK DNA database and existing um, UK fingerprint database. There's a there's a, a a thing called the UK Find Strategy Board, the Forensic Information Database Service. Neve sits on that group. I sit on that group, and um, there is an element of independent oversight there, but. Even then, I'm a bit nervous about fines because, to be honest, the chair of fines is always a police officer. They're always appointed by the Home Office. And it just smacks to me a bit like the police marking their own homework. So, yeah, um, I've probably said enough on that subject. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to Eric, in terms of, of um, you know, from, again, from what, what you heard and what you, what you yourself um, bring to this, um, this space and this discussion. In... in, in bringing this technology into the criminal justice system, what do you think are the unintended consequences and how do we protect ourselves against them? The point that was raised about the databases being commercial is that nowadays we have uh, two databases that are accessible to law enforcement. So that's Family Tree DNA and GEDmatch. But there is also another website that is relatively new. It's called DNA Justice. 
and it is a non-profit website, so it's really non-commercial, and its only goal is to help forensic investigations. Uh, there is a, a really well-designed informed consent where people are told about the risks and benefits. Um, so I think uh, probably that's a model that would be ideal in the future to have a database that it's purely for forensic purposes. And if somebody volunteers, it's not because they were attracted to it by the prospect of finding new DNA matches for their genealogical purposes, but strictly because they want their data to be used for forensic purposes. And I think that would solve a lot of uh, the ethical challenges that we're facing nowadays. So that's really interesting. Um, okay, ladies and gentlemen, um, is anybody got a, a burning question now is your time to stick up your hand um, and we'll see if we can get it answered. Please. Yes, the lady in front of me, you're going to have to shout a little bit for us. How expensive is it um, to do a DNA test um, from the police point of view? I take it it's extremely expensive. So the, the, the question is to get to Europe is how expensive is it to do a DNA test from the police point of view? It would certainly be many hundreds of pounds um, minimum uh, the, for the for the technology that's there um, at the moment because um, the way we save a lot of money is running a lot of samples at once. But in this situation, we would only really want to run one or two samples, um, and therefore the the cost per sample is still going to be really really high. I don't think that would be prohibitive uh, because I don't think we would do it very often. And the cases where we did want to do it spending a few hundred pounds or even a few thousand pounds wouldn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. Um, we would never do it for um, simple crimes like, like burglaries or anything like that. So it would never become a routine test. So the expense wouldn't matter too much. I think what would be m more expensive would be the genealogy side of things and paying a genealogist or a team of genealogists to go spend time digging around. I think that would be the, the really expensive part of it. Thank you very much. Is there another question? Yeah. Yes? Can we use SDR databases at the moment, which I take it, if I'm understanding right, I take it from people that have credit accounts. Is there not a way, I mean, instead of using public databases, but starting to build up a genetic database from those people, like in the same way that you best your start. I, I think the the big issue there is the ethical one because that person, you know, if somebody has um, been convicted of a crime, their DNA is held on our our databases, and I think we all accept that by and large, society accepts that as valid because they, they, they've they've been found guilty of something. But if we also process their genealogical data, then we are dragging their whole family up to their third cousins onto that database as well. And assuming that most of those other people are are innocent, I think that uh, that that would be a, a a big issue. I also think it's it's not it's not necessary if that individual's on the database. Then, um, we've got the information that we need to make a comparison with them in in the first place. So we're we're good as far as that goes. You don't see even if it's not Britain or Scotland, but other working with other countries decided to start databases. Like to starting their own genealogical databases. Yeah, even with the purpose of the SDR I I think I think the, the, the amount of data you get is is really prohibitive to to easily database. I know that these companies are doing it, but they, they're making money off it and in the different ways that Alison suggested I think it would be hard to justify for, for a publicly funded body to do that. But of course, if it's a dictatorship or something, then um, there's all kinds of other things that they, they might want to prioritise. Thank you very much. Do we have another question? Yes, please. I was just wondering why the UK was one of the countries that you said was the most, had to submit the most samples for sequencing. Well, I think this relates to what um, uh, both Brian and Eric have touched on is the very large numbers of samples on our on our database already in our criminal database. I think it's just because we started early. I think that's probably the, the, the main reason. Yeah, that's one of the reasons. The other reason is that um, in the UK, we um, keep people's DNA 
um, regardless of the gravity of the offence. So, you know, even if you're arrested for something quite minor, the police have the power in law um, to um, keep your DNA indefinitely, which probably isn't lawful anymore, but that's what happens. And then the other thing is that the police are um, very bad at weeding stuff, so they keep stuff for far too long. So the DNA profile can be kept for 100 years, Well, most of us won't live for 100 years. So that that's part of the reason why the, the, our uh, database is so big, is we take too much of it and we keep it for too long. Can it be used as a deterrent to you know, reduce crime if we have so much? I think the police are also very bad. So this sounds like I'm, I'm not, I mean, the police are very good, I should say. <laughs> what they're bad at is um, they're data rich, but they're information poor. Yeah. So they don't, um, I mean, we did a couple of uh, assurance reviews last March. Again, you can find them on our award winning website. Um, and where we looked at the acquisition of biometric data from children and from vulnerable adults. And so if you go to Police Scotland and you say to them, how many children did you arrest last year? They, they can tell you. If you say to them, how many of those children did you take DNA from? They can tell you. But if you then say to them, so from those 4,000 children that you took DNA, in how many instances did you match the DNA that you captured in the custody environment to an unsolved crime sample? They don't know because they don't collect the information. So, um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of things going on in this space, but what I would say is common across the UK is that police management information in relation to all forms of biometric data is really, really bad. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to ask, we're, we're just coming up to time, so I'm going to ask each of our, our panellists if you have um, any final, succinct um, uh, comment to make about um, the would we or could we, should we use this uh, as, a, as, a, as an emerging tool in criminal justice or any final remarks you want to make and then we'll close up? Uh, well, I think if there is good ethical guidance, we know that it, it has been used successfully in other countries. So I would, I would hope that some of the cold cases that haven't been solved could be solved using that technology. So, so of course, it's best to start with, uh, with the conventional methodologies first, but if they fail, I think it would be brilliant if we could uh, solve more cases uh, using these methods. Thank you. Brian? Yeah, I'm going to go the other way, unfortunately, mm -hmm. and uh, say that um, at the moment there isn't an obvious business need for it. And the other thing that's important for me is that when it has sometimes been claimed to be very successful in other jurisdictions, that often masks other feelings. So the one that they always shout about is the Golden State Killer uh, in America. But the bit that they don't tell you is that his brother was actually a convicted criminal and should have been on the DD database and they should have been able to find him that way. So uh, not for me, I'm afraid, at the moment. I, I think that where we are with these things just now, it's a bit like, you know, the automobile in the 1920s when there were far fewer on the road, but proportionally there were much more, many more fatalities and injuries because cars didn't have the safeguards built into them. They do know how they didn't have seat belts. They didn't have you know, reinforced metal, and there weren't the, the rules and the, like, you know, and, and the regulations about driving. And I think that as these things emerge, there will still always be risks, there will still always be cautions that we have to have around uh, safeguarding people and, and safeguarding their privacy. But I, I think we can probably get to a better position, yeah, with, mo with more safeguards, rules, and, and sort of proper standards in place. I think really we just have to proceed with with caution. Um, I can I can think of examples of of situations or cases where we might want to use this, but they are very few and far between. And as Brian says, we'd have to exhaust all the other avenues first. But I wouldn't want to rule it out altogether because at the end of the day, if you've got an unsolved murder or an unidentified body, that's a matter of, of public interest and maybe even public safety. And I wouldn't want to to shut the door on being able to take a killer off the streets, for example. 
so a, a mixed um, um, optimism, slight pessimism, maybe more than slight pessimism. So can I ask all of you, from given what you've heard this evening, how many of you would be comfortable putting your DNA onto 23andMe or Ancestry.com? Okay, that's not so bad. Um, ladies and gentlemen, thank you uh, very much indeed for coming out um, on your Pancake Tuesday um, to uh, listen to our panel. This panel was brought to you by the Lady Hume Research Centre for Forensics at the University of Dundee. It remains for me both to thank uh, our, our panellists, but also our team, Heather Doran, who is our Public Engagement Manager, Clara Morris up at the back, who is also on our Public Engagement team, and thank you again very much for your attention and your interesting questions. Thank you very much. Um, Heather's just going to put up um, a slide, which if you are thinking of going on to Ancestry or 23andMe or any of these databases, it just has one or two, you know, sort of helpful suggestions for things you can do to protect your privacy and, and your data a little bit better. The main one is never, ever use your real name. <laughs> <laughs> use a, a, a code or a username, please. Thank you. Okay. Thanks very much indeed.